You're listening to the Shire Fit Podcast. This series, Max and Johnny explore how to become the master of your mindset. Mindset series, me and Johnny are here. We have uh, a warm-up which is based around changes or fluctuations in your body, weight or image. We've got a strength section which talks about high rocks, the dirty word of fitness at the moment. (laughs) And a workout which is talking about uh, the management of your own fears on losing gains, either in fitness or strength during periods of training. I'm excited for that one. Yes. We are going to do so slightly different format this week, guys. Uh, we usually do a listener question. This is not a listener question. This Most of these questions come from Amaret. Um, does she not listen? Well... Maybe she does. I hope she does because <laughs> this will be a waste of time us answering it, won't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, uh, when I say, sorry, member, it wasn't a member's question. It was Amaret's uh, question. So Amaret uh, asked about um, a couple of things and what I thought would be interesting today would be if me and Johnny sort of took it in turns talking about the body image, nutritional side, which obviously more towards Johnny's strength and then my side being more towards like the fitness, the programming and the... the um, different cycles so warm-up question is this for johnny how do you manage the fear of changes in your body like fluctuations in weight or leanness that you might uh, not like but know you're healthier for so i think we're talking about how we look how we feel and potentially even another metric saying that we've put on weight or something and then how do you manage that knowing that you potentially were leaner and maybe you've put on a little bit of weight now even yeah, you need that. Yeah, yeah, and the health the health questions an interesting part of that question as well, which I'll address at the end because the fear of it is totally normal. So that's what I want to say first off is that it's totally understandable to have a fear over uh, weight gain over a, over a think a thought about weight gain. So like what I mean by that is if you look maybe bigger or or less lean than normal. And there's a lot to be said there in terms of our own image of ourselves. And so our own image of ourselves fluctuates on a moment-to-moment basis, let alone day-to-day basis, and can also be affected by how we feel, what we've eaten, how uh, stressed we might be, how hydrated we are, as well as what we weigh, right? So if you're weighing yourself regularly and you see that number, then that can affect the way you feel, particularly if it is up, right? And so it's it's necessary to say that weight fluctuations on a day-to-day basis are absolutely really normal and actually for what we might say someone's like healthier set point would be in terms of where their weight sits at their best that in itself fluctuates five to ten percent of of someone's weight so quite big swings really when you think about it in terms of kilos and pounds yeah go on let's go into kilos and pounds with that like so like generally so let's say if like i'm 100 kilos yeah so like i might fluctuate five to ten kilos in the course of like a couple of weeks or a yeah. couple of months whatever and i just think that's useful for the members because definitely. yeah they'll put on like a kilo and go like oh this is crazy but actually it's perfectly normal right? it's, it's so normal yeah. and, the, and the thing is is that actually now the so when i was taught nutrition which was um throughout the years of sort of like 2015 to 2018 with most of my nutrition specific credentials the the crack was all around hey weigh yourself regularly as regularly as you can get you know look at the fluctuations become really um blanked by them like really neutral for them and track your average over time but the emerging research now is that actually the more that people weigh the worse they feel because they get so wrapped up in their weight being the key metric that they're trying to monitor the key thing that they value the key thing about their performance um, and their self-worth right which is why I say the fear if the fear is valid but the fear comes from that fear that like as we've discussed before leaner is better leaner is better performer leaner is better looking all of these things and if that's paired with a low body image day where you feel a little bit crap about yourself that's going to compound those negative thoughts whereas on a day-to-day basis other people will look at you and be like you look the same right so you've got to assess whether weighing yourself is a helpful strategy at all Because really, if you go off of how you feel, how you feel with fueling your body for training, how you feel with your relationship with food in terms of listening to your body, um, allowing yourself the things that you desire, but also being very conscious in your choice around the amount of those foods and how they genuinely make you feel, right? So when I say that, people are like, oh yeah, well, I could desire to have three croissants at a sitting. And you're like, well, no, you wouldn't because halfway through the second you'd probably start to feel quite sick and ill but you just think that you do because they are really nice when you have that one so it's it's becoming much more conscious about 
your choices, how they make you feel, having that body food congruence there. And the point about health is great because particularly for women with that focus on like aesthetics and leanness, as we said, it can get that far that it affects your menstrual cycle. Mm. And then that's when you start to damage your health with that being missing. Um, And particularly for Amaret, who asked the question, very high volume of training, there then Hopefully needs our to menstrual be, cycle is, 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 still good. is intact. Yeah, and we can't talk about that because we don't know it. <laughs> and, and, I'm sure she won't mind. And what I, well, what I wanted to say with that, though, is that you, you've mentioned uh, members' names a couple times with the questions. And so yeah. if someone does want to ask a question anonymously, yeah. please, please do. And we won't, obviously won't uh, use your name in the podcast. But So the point there is that if things... And, and Red S affects both men and women, but that is the biggest... Um, that's the biggest side effect in women whereas men it's it's not there but if you're always ill all the time or you're always tired all the time or mm. you get injured easily or you just feel like your immune system's lower the wellness industry will have you by the balls because before you know it you'll be taking a supplement for joint health or you'll mm. be taking a supplement for immune boosting and all of this other stuff like greens powder and it's like no you just need and to in reality, eat you're probably more. under fueling yeah. yeah um so let's just spell this out a little bit again just i think fleshing it out as for a summary is tell me what you heard no it? no so uh, let's spill it out um in this like so you've got a an athlete they're competing at whatever let's say 70 kilos and they're lean and ripped and shredded and they go into the competition probably feel awesome on the workouts but get buried by heavy bars and they know they need to then put on weight in order to be able to manage um, you know, lifting of higher higher weights and higher volumes and things, or potentially they've realised that they're sick all the time, right. getting injured all the time, all that sorts of things. How do they manage that fear of like, oh, I've got to put on, you know, let's say they do, they start eating a little bit more and they've put on a little bit of weight and they're mm. feeling a little bit bigger. What what techniques, t- tactics would you use to help them so through my, that situation? My my best tactic for them would be to take away the thing that creates the fear, which is the knowledge of how much they weigh. Okay, because it's not helpful. Yeah, it, if if all it does is make you feel worse and then affect the amount you eat, it's not a strategy that's helping. Same you. with like, I assume progress pictures. Like yeah, all of those things. What's the point? You? Yeah, like you're not you're not yeah. competing on a bodybuilding stage, and that's where progress pictures came from. Yeah, progress pictures and calipers and all the rest of it came from the bodybuilding world of like, oh, we need to see striations in veins. We need to have like mm. identical muscle groups. Like it's a really really body image centric sport, and the people that come out of that then do have incredibly low levels a lot of the time of body satisfaction mm. and, and high levels of disordered eating so you then need to consider i'm in a performance sport here um so how much i weigh doesn't really matter mm. because if i'm improving my strength which is my main focus and that comes with a bit of weight gain still going to be able to move myself in relation to gymnastics mm. right because that's a strength and skill focus anyway and if i feel better than with heavy barbells i've achieved my goal which was a higher level of performance town looks good so, um, I feel like maybe there's one more really relevant example that we should probably go for is like, maybe let's say a pregnant woman who's managing putting on weight during pregnancy mm. and then potentially getting a bit of a fear on that. How mm. how would you manage that? Again, it's, it's, it's a case of, I would question why someone was weighing themselves in that period. No, not necessarily and weight, maybe just the but fact like that they, they, they are getting it, bigger. Yeah, yeah. It's and it, and again it is hard because you see yourself in a certain way and then when you see yourself in certain reflections and mirrors that give you certain angles or photos or things like that, mm. you can instantly maybe become quite negative of yourself particularly if you're looking for that. Mm. And so it's one of those where pregnancy is such an interesting perspective because really there should be no better time to put all of the onus into focusing on how you feel yeah because you are growing another human life yeah, your job during pregnancy isn't is to, to look good or feel good or whatever you know like well, yeah and train and, uh, really hard it's it's it's, it's, it's a case of another human it's a case of bringing up another human life yeah. right and they, they are effectively in a it's not a symbiotic relationship it is a parasitical one in just that the baby is taking what it needs from you Mm. you're not getting anything from the baby really apart from the pleasure and the joy that you are growing a human life which is just absolutely fascinating Mm. like it still blows my mind every day with as as we both know natalie's now 25 weeks so Mm. the process of that is fascinating and it's one of those where people can get self-conscious about the way they look and it is again it's from the fear of if i gain weight I'm going to look less attractive, I'm going to be less worthy, all of these things. And it's actually getting over that. Mm. It's getting over that thought process because that thought process has been drilled into us by society, media, social media, that that is like the pinnacle of what 
fit, healthy and, and attractive looks like. And then it's also thinking, well, there's two there's two things in there because people are like, oh, you're eating for two. And then other people are like, you're not eating for two. Don't do that. And and obviously the latter is more of the actual thing to listen to. So it's it's the same argument when people talk about food freedom and intuitive eating. It's not the eat whatever you want all the time diet. It's the let's really tune into what our body's and telling us. To what it's telling you, yeah. And and then go go with that. Stay checked in at meal times, stay checked in at snack times and trust that your body keeps the score. Like mm. it knows it knows what it needs because it's feeding the baby. And then when you have the baby, nothing will teach you that more than like feeding a baby and feeding an infant. How they're just like, I want food now, now I don't. I want food now, now I don't. I don't want that food, I want that food. And it, I think that's cool. Like if you really checked in during pregnancy, you can kind of see that for yourself and then how that plays out with your toddler and how that's just kind of what the body does. Wicked. Yeah, no, I think that's really useful um, for anyone who's going through that sort of problem at the moment. Um, strength section then is about high rocks, guys. That our take on a popular fitness concept. And I think the concept here is quite controversial. Johnny's got quite a controversial opinion on it. I'm excited to hear it. <laughs> so the take is that high rocks will dominate functional fitness competitions in the future and going forward. We have seen a rapid, you have to admit, we have yeah, seen a has, rapid has growth grown. in uh, popularity of the high rocks competitions. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, do you think that the, it will dominate functional fitness space in the future? No, I think it will peak and die off, personally. Strong. Strong opinion. And I've seen it grow in gyms because a, a mate of mine owns a gym down in Northampton and his members love it. And, and they're even now like a High Rocks partner gym, I think. And and you see now coaches elevating themselves into the, the status of like, oh, I'm a High Rocks coach mm. and like, I help High Rocks athletes do sort of X, Y, and Z. And that's great. Like, fair enough. Like, you are providing a service to people that want it. High Rocks is standardized. It's repeatable. It's what we chatted about before about the CrossFit Games, how it's, it is that random. Mm. And we talked about like how you you kind of want always an absolute strength event. You want an absolute speed event to kind of measure the different aspects of fitness. Mm. High Rocks is just aerobic. Mm. It's like, it's this long workout and you can do it really fast when you're really strong and you've got great aerobic capacity mm. that you can work at threshold for longer. That's effectively it, right? And the people who are the strongest and fastest will always win. And it's like, practically body weight there's no really heavy weights in it the sled push and pull for mm. elite is quite heavy i think mm. um i think it's yeah, 125 so kilos for anyone or something. who's listening who doesn't know it's like is it 10k yeah because it's a kilometer k- of running yeah. between every station and then the stations are like a hundred of things stuff, 100 so war like, balls yeah. 100 burpee broad jumps yeah, like ski, 100 kettlebell um, swings Put sled push, sled pull. Well, that's the thing. They've got a kilometre row and a kilometre ski, have they, next to a kilometre run? Yeah. So it's really aerobic. Yeah. It's really aerobic. Mm. But the thing that, the reason why it's so popular is that it's gone in a day. Mm. You go there and, like, your your whole heat can be done in, like, a couple of hours. Mm. You can do pairs, you can do singles you can, everyone's there like everyone's got t-shirts and and you've got different you've got different uh, events like the elite versus the regular and, and there's different weight categories so it's very accessible for everyone the movements are all really simple yeah ball, ball burpee kettlebell yeah, swing i'd say that's one of the key selling it's features is it's super accessible yeah anyone can rock up and just push a sled you don't have to be able to do anything high skill it's yes and if you want to know how to market a business if you yeah. follow the high rocks growth they've done amazingly because it is all about the event it's like the music and the spectators and the social media shares and the t-shirts and the buzz and the then the repeatability of that nature means that someone so rather than a crossfit event right you you can't compare your score at regionals to your score last year at regionals really because they're completely different events whereas doing high rocks twice is like doing cindy twice yeah i've improved yeah, it's right. like it's like the marathon of it is the marathon of, of functional, functional fitness, fitness right now. It's yeah. standard, repeatable, and yeah. it's completely accessible. But with that, it is always the same thing. Mm. So I think you'll get to a stage where people will will top out at it because they're like, "Why would I do it again? I've done it three times. I've I've got my fill of that. Mm. I I want to improve at something else now." Yeah, I think it really appeals to like your work dog kind of. Co- customer member who just wants they don't care about like skills or you know yeah lot big weightlifting numbers or anything like that it's literally they just want to come in sweat and graft and i think like there is a subset of crossfitters who are that person just suffer just want to yeah just want to come in and thrash themselves and, and they've I think, got a good essence for that i think high rocks just appeals to that person of that nature just like get your head down and go for it um 
But yeah, I also agree with Johnny is that I think it will peak and tail off because I think there is a limited number of those people. Yeah. Um, you know, in any one CrossFit class that I coach, I'd say there's probably four out of 10 that like, want to just smash themselves to oblivion the rest are there to learn something new enjoy moving their bodies pick up a skill mm. you know have fun whatever and you get and uh, i was i actually think it's like appeals quite a lot more to the traditional like early days crossfit back when you and me started where mm. people just come in and it was all about just like when we do like seal fit days you mean yeah just thrash yourself let's to just oblivion suffer for, for no hour. reason yeah. yeah um and i think that person will eventually run out but I might be wrong. No, I agree with you. Uh, it is growing well at the moment. And, you know, it is, I'm not going to lie. I'm sat here now and I, I've thought about doing one myself. You said you'd never do one, didn't you? But Yeah. Not, yeah. It's like, I'd, I would maybe do a pairs yeah. because I, I love like interval training and, yeah. and that's why I prefer group comps to individual. Yeah. I'd never do an individual one like yeah. suffering for that long. I mean, I mean to be fair, it. I have got an aerobic essence, like yeah, an hour have, yeah. row, for yeah, example, yeah. I yeah, would yeah. prefer to do in like 500 meter sprints. Yeah. But yeah. And, and as I said, it's the event, isn't it? And everybody's mm. there. And mm. if you've got like a huge group of people from your gym, like you'd have a great day yeah. out and all the rest. And the, and the world champs are in like Vegas and things like that. Like it's, it's yeah. a huge event. Well, it seems like everyone qualifies for the world champs. Isn't it? Have you noticed that? Like, I know so many mean. people who like but post afterwards. Again, oh, is that I've a market, is that the, marketing? Yeah, I've qualified for the world champs. Yeah. yeah. Um, I was going to say, and I nearly forgot. I'm glad you twigged me on it. Is I think that Hyrox has done a good job of fulfilling a uh, lack of something that CrossFit didn't do, which was test work capacity enough. Yeah. They tested too much lifting, probably too much skills now, and I think they're testing pure work capacity, which is awesome. It will be interesting to see how the rival companies towards Hyrox perform. Like, for example, the new one that's just started, Affix, which uh, is yeah, run in a similar Mark. fashion. Yeah, well, I know the people Marshall behind Mark. it because my old coach, Craig, is part of the organisational team for it. Yeah, so it's like, I don't know if you've seen, but it's a similar format in that yeah. you turn up, there's zones, you've got a lifting zone, and you move into your recovery zone, and yeah. it's all mapped out through the arena. I do think that will ri- rival that. It will. Potentially. Because I, I, I've, I I've chatted to Craig a fair bit about it, and it's the same point of, because Craig used to program for Rainhill Trials. Mm. So the olden days of the Rainhill Trials, when there was like a power output test, and then like a speed workout, and then a strength workout, and then a classic CrossFit workout, and then a, a chipper, and then mm. a, like a work capacity, and then a final. That was Craig. Mm. Because he was like, we need to test the different aspects of fitness. And yeah. that's what they want to bring to Affex. Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see how those two battle against each other going yeah. forward. Yeah. yeah. Um, finishing off then with the workout, which is basically the same question that Johnny answered about body image and nutrition, uh, but in the fitness space. So the question is, how do you manage the fear of losing gains on a specific cycle? for example strength during an aerobic cycle or fitness during a strength cycle so for example someone might follow a specific strength cycle to work on let's say their back squat and improve their back squat Um, and during that period they'll be doing less aerobic volume or less fitness in general or work capacity I should say Um, and as a result feel like or you know in this sense Amaret was probably feeling like she was losing her fitness by not doing the fitness stuff. So the question, the answer, just going straight to Amrit on this one, is not to do it all at all times and try and uh, do really hard fitness, really hard strength, really hard everything because um, the body doesn't respond that well to that. You get a messy stimulus. And that is why we, as a brand, have broken our programming cycles down into biased cycles. Now, it's not to say you can't train both at the same time. You can, but if you bias towards strength, aerobic capacity, uh, lactate, um, what's the energy system? I can't even think about it now. Well, anaerobic. Anaerobic, sorry. (laughs) Can't even think about the cycle, (laughs) beginner. Um, Yeah, uh, anaerobic system, whatever. Um, If you bias the cycle, you get a clearer stimulus of this is is where we're going. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean you can't get stronger during an aerobic cycle. You can, but you're not going to get as clear a strength progression as you would 
if you're biased towards that anyway so going back to the actual point of like how do you actually manage the fear of that this is what i would recommend and that is to realize that your body has different functions and you have to train them all and that having a bigger aerobic base will only allow you to get stronger in the future because your recovery will improve for example spend most of your life in the aerobic system the majority of your life um, and so by having a bigger aerobic base you'll recover faster and therefore be able to ac- accommodate more strength volume in the future this is why there's quite a trend now towards olympic lifters and things starting to do a little bit of aerobic work in their training warm-up specific days of aerobic stuff because it's starting to realize that actually if i'm hide- hideously unfit my recovery is poor um, likewise if you're working on um say your aerobic fitness and you're worried about your strength wrong way around sorry working on your strength you're worried about your aerobic fitness just recognize that if you get stronger when you then go back into workouts with lighter barbells and things they will feel better and you'll be able to move them better your body will be more robust you'll be able to accumulate more volume and so on so it's recognizing that yes you might lose something in the short term but it's about gaining in the long term that's what i would recommend in terms of management of that yeah i'd agree because like we spoke about the other week with regards to the interference effect there's less of that with regards to aerobic and strength yeah and if you're somebody who is we have to break this down into terms of who what the person's training for how often they're training that kind of thing so if you're training like once a day coming in and doing some strength and skill followed by an aerobic session at the end is a good way to do it because you're fresher while you're lifting and you're able to get that work done um and let's say if you're if you're pairing higher volume lower intense strength work with then aerobic work those things are going to uh, work nicely together as you said in the breathe cycle versus the gain cycle you might have a few sessions dedicated to just strength and hypertrophy and a session dedicated to aerobic work and then flip that around the other way with breathe that works well because the amount of volume to maintain something is far less than to gain something mm. so you could maintain your strength on one to two full body sessions a week for example and then you can gain your aerobic system with three to four sessions a week so Mm. when you get into training twice a day like a competitor might pairing your aerobic work with your strength work is is best again and then as you peak towards competition you're going to flip that on its head and you're going to start focusing on one to two anaerobic sessions a week you'll still do aerobic on other sessions you do your conditioning first in the day ideally and do your strength and skill later on in the day and your strength and skill work will will change from um like max contractions aerobic hypertrophy work to intensity one rep maxes or speed strength work and strength speed work like olympic lifting barbell cycling strength endurance that got more crossfit specific strength work as opposed to flyers literally just coming straight at me flyers attacking max apart from uh strength work right so you're basically building strength in the off season and then expressing your strength and developing your endurance in the um as you peak towards a comp so it's it's again it's what you're training for and uh, if you periodize it that way you will develop all of the things over time you're just not trying to do all of that at the same time Mm. and like yeah, like Johnny says, you can still concurrently make progress. You can be, you can improve aerobic capacity a little bit during a strength cycle. It's not to say you can't do both. You can, but if you do do bias, you're probably going to get more reward yeah. out of the thing that you are biasing towards. And that's why we've chosen to set up our programming like that. The recognition that the long-term picture is for your body to bring all of these things up at one time is really important in that the sport is a generalist sport we're not specific athletes it's not like powerlifters who have squat bench dead for maximal lifts that's it in which case aerobic training for them needs to be a very tiny function like part of their system whereas and everything needs to be more towards strength and absolute strength you know with us we're trying to be generally good across the board at all these things Mm. so why is you know i would ask yourself the question of why are you worried about losing strength when you could gain in other areas and crossfit's about all of the areas being as high as you can yeah i I guess i could understand the fear of losing it because you don't want to like go back to a stage before bring that up then that's Mm. gone back to the stage before and i think that's what happens when you try and do it all at the same time is that nothing really improves Mm. whereas i think then the idea of trying to like put it on the maintenance burner 
yeah and realizing when you when you come to start progressing it it might be a feel a bit weird at first but you'll get into the groove and then you'll see progress quicker yeah and as you said the idea is progress over the long term rather than the short term mm. and i think that's a really great point because you'll see too many people who try to max out every uh, six to eight weeks or every mm. 12 weeks and they're like why haven't i pb'd in this 12 week period and that might have been something you were able to do when you were in your younger training age journey yeah. whereas yeah. when you start getting into years and years of training like you're literally marginal gains here mm. um a couple of kilos here and there and and over longer periods of time and you are in the infinite game then of strength and fitness and also there t- it's like we've said before there's a time to test and there's a time to train and i would say that with regards to competitions competition is great fun group competitions are great fun we, we know they are and there is a season where you could do one every bloody weekend mm. but if you're doing that you're not getting a lot of time to train mm. and particularly if that competition has qualifiers think about the amount of intensity that goes through having to do three four weeks qualifiers and then have all of that like anxiety every week of like having to do it once or twice trying to build your training around that then oh th- those qualifiers are done oh now th- th- those qualifiers are coming out in three weeks I need to be ready for those. You're kind of constantly in a state of intensification. Yeah, it's just a lot of energy spent in it. And no accumulation. Mm. You might spend an entire year doing that and you actually haven't gotten any better. Um, so it's a, I'd say if you're doing that to get competition experience and enjoyment, I'd pick like three or four a year Yeah, that are far enough apart and, and go for those. A note on that is the other method of doing this is to take some time out and let's say, for example just focus on weightlifting for three months and then come back and build your fitness back up. In my experience, that doesn't ever, ever really work that well. No. In that, let's say, um, this is arbitrary numbers, I'm just throwing them out there, but let's say I've seen this happen before. Someone will go, they'll do a weightlifting program, they'll add 20 kilo onto their back squat, they'll add 10 kilo onto their snatch and 10 kilo on their clean and jerk at the end of their strength cycle. Brilliant, they're buzzing. Then they go back to CrossFit, and they start crossfitting again, doing fitness, and uh, they lose <laughs> 10 kilos off of their back squat and 7 kilos off of their clean and jerk and 5 kilos off their snatch, which is probably what they would have progressed at the same time if they'd have just carried on doing crossfit and biased slightly towards strength. And yeah. that's what I just see over and over again. If, this is the key if, they actually have the guts to stay as they, when they come back into CrossFit. Because a lot of people, I don't know if you've seen this, but I have over the years loads. People go out, they do a three month Olympic lifting block. They then come back to do fitness, CrossFit, and they go, oh my God, this feels so hard. I've lost all of my Dublinders. I can't do keeping pull-ups anymore, X, Y, Z. And then they fall off the wagon. That's mm-hmm. what I've seen a lot. Um, don't Can relate to that. Yeah. <laughs> Personally, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but I didn't. I didn't take time off to wait to come back. I just took time off and thought I would never come back. Um, yeah, and that, and that comes back to that same point, isn't it, Max? About biasing and volume of maintenance versus gaining like yeah. you can do three to four sessions of weightlifting a week and then one to two aerobic sessions and then you'll keep your aerobic system ticking over yeah your anaerobic engine might start to dip but it's a case of when do you need to peak that and again if your aerobic system is building 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 you'll find then that your ability to go hard for longer will improve mm-hmm. as you start to train that so yeah it's just a case of, of of not just knocking it on the head completely depending on what your goals are yeah so basically the key message in this whole podcast was everyone just needs to chill out a bit, don't they? <laughs> Humans in general. Just chill out. Just chill out. Right. I hope you enjoyed that, guys. I hope you took something away from it. That was episode five. We've got three to go. Mm. I've come up with three more. That's it. Yeah, cool. Eight in the mindset cycle. So, uh, yeah, we'll release this one today and then back on track for weekly. And um, what I just reiterate is if you want to ask a question anonymously. Yes, I do. Get in touch. No, no, no. Like, if, 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 just get in touch with Max um, yeah. in the gym or any of the coaches to pass along or send us a message. And we won't take the piss out of you like I've done with oh, Amaret today. With Amaret, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we're, we're very empathetic here. <laughs> Wicked. Right. See you later, guys. Thank you for listening to the Shire Fit podcast with Max and Johnny. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we will see you next week for another episode. 